Let's get started. Any questions? Questions? OK. Um, let me uh, then pose a question myself. Uh, that is a conceptual question. We're doing Ampere's law, and I'd like to continue today with more examples. Uh, but this is a sort of um, touching base on the basics of the law. So I have here um, a contour where I want to apply the law. And I'm saying, what is the total current enclosed by the closed curve shown below in the sense of Ampere's law? Anybody wants to try this one? So we're tracing the path, as you see, um, counter, sorry, clockwise this way. Okay, so our DL points this way in the clockwise uh, sense. So the positive sense of the current is given by the right hand rule. So I'm using my right, there are many right hand rules. So we have to keep track of which one is which. So here, right hand rule means that I'm, I'm using my right hand to trace the path and then uh, my thumb shows the direction of DS in the Ampere law, which is the direction in which the current is considered to be positive. The other thing I wanted to bring to your attention is this notation with the dots and the x's. Uh, the x means that the current goes into the board, the dot comes out of the board. Again, I had said this before and I will um, repeat it. Imagine that you have an arrow like this and then if the arrow goes into the board, you will see the x. If the arrow comes out of the board, you will see the tip of the arrow, so you see the dot. So if uh, you forget about this convention, uh, this is a mnemonic rule to keep it in mind. So therefore, we have now to calculate the enclosed currents, keeping in mind which is positive, which is negative. So obviously, these are positive, these are negative, but only these are enclosed. You see, the, with Ampere's law, we have uh, something similar to Gauss's law. It doesn't matter that there are currents outside. The law is talking about the currents that you are enclosing, actually, with the curve. So therefore, here, you have uh, I4 plus I3 minus I2. This is the answer. And if we uh, put the numbers there, uh, I4 is 2 amps, uh, I3 is 1 minus 2, that is uh, 1. Um, so that is the enclosed current. Again, I want to emphasize the two things, that the fact that there are other wires outside plays no role, and you have to keep in mind the positive convention. So this is uh, the same question uh, phrased in the opposite way. The total current enclosed by the closed curve below is 2 amps. So here we're being given the enclosed current. So what is the magnitude and the direction of I3? So again, we are uh, going uh, down the path, uh, the closed path in the clockwise uh, sense. And therefore, the positive direction of current flow is into the board. And therefore, uh, we have uh, as enclosed current minus I2 plus I4 and then I'm putting there I3, which is an unknown. And if it comes out to be positive, it will be going into the board. If it comes out to be negative, it will be coming out of the board. So then uh, this gives me an equation. Minus 2 plus 5 plus I3 is equal to 2 amps. So that means that I3 is minus 1. And that means that uh, I3 has a magnitude of 1 amp and comes out of the board. Okay, since it came out negative from the equation, that means that the direction is, is out of the board. So these are the basics of uh, Ampere's law. And of course, Ampere's law holds not just for uh, distributions like this, like wires, but also for volume or surface uh, current densities. We saw an example that was the only example I was able to go through yesterday with a solid conductor. And now I will just do a very similar one, I hope to uh, go through it uh, fairly quickly, with a cylindrical shell. Uh, so the second example is K 
current density, again uh, uh, flowing in the z direction, in this cylindrical shell of inner radius A and outer radius B. So the current flows uh, right here in between the two conductors. It is a shell, it's not a coaxial cable, so it is, uh, there is uh, simply vacuum in here. So just to see the distribution more clearly, it also helps when we flip this cable and we plot the current distribution in a way that the z-axis faces your direction. So this is the shell, inner radius A, outer radius B, and the current flows right here. In between. So the z-axis in this case comes out of the board. Uh, I flip uh, the, uh, the cylindrical shell so that you can see the uh, current distribution and we have this uh, current density that describes the distribution as J naught Z hat for R between A and B. So that is my current distribution. The question is to find the magnetic field. Okay. So what is the first thing that comes to mind when we're given such a current distribution? It is cylindrically symmetric because it does not depend on phi and it does not depend on z. It depends on r because if you have r less than a, you don't have a current. If you have R greater than B, you don't have a current. So you have a current only between A and B for the radial coordinate of the cylindrical coordinate system. Therefore, it does depend on R. Uh, and uh, hence, the uh, current distribution is cylindrically symmetric because it depends only on R. So this is the first feature. The second feature is that the current flows in the z direction. So when you have a cylindrically symmetric current distribution that points in the z direction, when you have those two conditions, then you can right away say that the magnetic field will be also cylindrically symmetric. That is an easy conclusion because if the sources are cylindrically symmetric, then the effects of the sources should also be cylindrically symmetric. The effect is the field. And so it can only depend on R. And it will be pointing in the phi direction. So the magnetic flux lines are circulating around the current. So we have here a similar case as yesterday. So this is uh, my current distribution. I will exaggerate it. I will um, draw it a little bit bigger. This is what I have. The current comes out. It's uniform. Uh, this is A. This is B. And the magnetic field lines will be circulating in the phi direction. So I will have magnetic field lines like this, magnetic field lines like this, magnetic field lines like this. In other words, the magnetic field lines are already closed and circular. So if I'm looking for which path to use to apply Ampere's law, these are the paths. The, I will be applying Ampere's law along the closed field lines that are formed by this cylindrical current distribution. And I have three cases because there are three regions that are being defined by this cylindrical shell. The inner region, the region of the shell, and the region outside the shell. So I will take three cases. That is case one, 
what I will, I will apply the law here at C1. This will be case two. I will apply the law at C2. And this will be case three, where I will apply uh, the law outside at uh, C3. So these are all circles. Uh, the deviation of this, these contours from a circle, it's just due to my <coughs> imperfect drawing skills. They are supposed to be circles. OK, so I will apply the law in these three cases. So case one. I will apply the law on C1, and uh, the left-hand side, it's h dot dl. So h is h phi of r phi hat. So r is uh, my the radius of the circle. I won't be introducing any additional variables like uh, R0 or whatever. So I will call the radius here R less than A. Uh, and uh, the dot product will be done with a DL, which is the uh, differential length element along the circle. That is R d phi. So phi dot phi is equal to 1 d phi integrated from 0 to 2 pi, that will be 2 pi r, the length of the circle, basically, the uh, circumference of the circle times h phi of r. So that will be the left-hand side. What will be the right-hand side here? So what is the enclosed current? Enclosed current? Zero. So the enclosed current here is zero. So clearly, I'm applying uh, the law in a region where the current is not present. And therefore, the enclosed current is 0. That gives me h phi of r less than a is 0. No magnetic field inside. So the shell. Um, shields uh, essentially the inner region, and there is no magnetic field that leaks inside. All right, uh, second case. Let me push this board up and see more clearly. Second case is. Uh, when I use now uh, this uh, uh, path C2, the second circle, which has a radius uh, between A and B. So the left-hand side will actually remain in all cases the same. No matter what is my radius, if it is less than A between A and B or greater than B, the integral, as you see over there, is independent of the radius. It is always h phi to pi r. The integration is done with respect to the angle phi from 0 to pi. So always the result is the same. So left-hand side is still the same. The only thing I have to worry about is the right-hand side, the enclosed current. So how much is the enclosed current? Any, any ideas? Maybe I should uh, move this back. So any ideas in closed current? So you see I'm enclosing only this portion of the current. Only this portion of the current. 
so the area basically that I'm enclosing is pi times r squared minus a squared. I have to simply subtract the area of the disk of radius r from the area of disk of radius a. And that will be the area. And I need to multiply that with j naught, which is the constant current density. So that is the current that I'm enclosing, very simply. So that means that Ampere's law tells me h phi for r from a to b times 2 pi r will be current enclosed, which is j naught pi r squared minus a squared. And that now gives me the uh, current, sorry, the magnetic field in this region. And uh, again, I will prefer to leave the pi on the numerator and the denominator so that you see exactly the components of this, uh, of this uh, formula. And uh, you see that the magnetic field inside the shell is growing because uh, the numerator is growing as r squared, the denominator is growing as r. So therefore, overall, we have a linear growth of the current inside uh, the shell. Uh, finally, case three, r is greater than b. The enclosed current now you uh, enclose the entire uh, shell. So this is uh, the, the third contour. So you see the third contour encloses the entire shell, the entire current. And uh, that is J naught times pi B squared minus A squared, which is the total uh, area of the shell, the total cross section of the shell. So you see, uh, if uh, C2 extends, then it encloses more and more and more current. And then when you hit the edge of the shell and you go outside, you don't enclose any more current. You've exhausted all the current that there is. And then no matter how big C3 will be, it will enclose still the same current, which is the current, the total current carried by the shell, which is uh, J naught, the uh, density, uh, times the cross section of the shell, which is pi b squared minus a squared. And then h phi r greater than b times 2 pi r will be this current of the shell, b squared minus a squared, not the denominator yet, and that gives me the last region. By 2 pi r, again, we see that the uh, magnetic field, as we would expect, decays as one over distance from the z axis, which is also the axis of, the, uh, of this uh, shell. OK, so this is uh, the first example. Let me. the board up. So any questions on this? Questions? Okay, uh, so then let me go to the third example. Surface current density. This is the example that we did with the Biot-Savart law before. Uh, so we have uh, this infinite plane, the z equal zero plane, like this. So it goes all the way to infinity. 
It's exactly the example that we did with uh, Biosavar, in fact, one week ago. And there is a uniform surface current density on this plane that flows in the y direction. So constant surface charge density, sorry, current density at z equal zero. So this is the magnetic analog of the problem that we did in electrostatics where we had this infinite uh, charged plane. So again, it uh, helps to look at this distribution from the side that the current comes towards us. So the side of the y-axis, so you see this uh, current comes uh, uh, from the y-axis. So that would be something like this. We have the y-axis here. We have the z-axis. And then the x-axis goes this way, x, y, z. So then if we were looking at this distribution from this point of view, the y-axis, then we would see the current coming towards us. So we would see current lines coming towards us like this. <coughs> so this is the surface current density that we see. So what can we say about symmetries in this problem? What kinds of symmetries do you see? I think we had discussed this also in the Biosavar law. Any ideas? Right, so this is a rectangular geometry. For example, uh, can the field depend on x? Do you expect to see a field that depends on x? No. On y, no. The reason being that this is like an infinite plane. We had mentioned this argument many, many times. Uh, so if you fix your, if you imagine that you are uh, operating a drone, at a fixed height, and it flies over the distribution, basically no, everywhere it goes, it will see exactly the same thing. Because this is uh, like those cornfields in the Midwest. So everywhere that you fly over, you see just the same thing. And therefore, you see the same sources. You have to see the same effect of the sources. And uh, that means that there is no dependence on the fields. So the magnetic field intensity has to be a function of z only. This being said, we can also notice the following, that this current density looks like a stack of wires. So you, it's a continuous current that flows on the surface. I could have implemented it as a stack of wires that I uh, put next to each other. And those wires would be represented by these dots. Each one of these, I know what field they produce. They actually produce a circulating field like this. So you see, when you stack them up the next, the one next to the other, very close to each other, the envelope of all these circular magnetic field lines, the envelopes superimpose on each other and give you magnetic field lines that are straight. In the x direction, on the top, 
and in the minus x direction at the bottom. So with this argument, of course, I could have done this also with the Biot-Savart law. Uh, I think I showed this last week. But this is a little bit quicker to do and more intuitive to understand. So I have just straight lines here that point in the x direction on the top and in the minus direction at the bottom, the minus x direction at the bottom. So basically, the magnetic flux lines will have to be straight. Uh, they close at infinity. Uh, always they are closed. Here we have a degenerate case where we have an infinite structure. The lines go all the way to infinity. And imagine they close there. But uh, the point here is that they are also a not function of z. Because you see, whatever comes up on this side is actually the opposite of what comes on that side. So therefore, I can conclude that the magnetic field intensity has this form, some function of z unknown on the top and in the x direction, and minus of that at the bottom. So you see, if I have z equal to minus 5, the magnetic field will be minus of the magnetic field of f, uh, the magnetic field at absolute value of minus 5, which is 5. That is a statement that the magnetic field will have to be a node function of z, just as shown by this diagram. A similar argument can be made if you uh, do this with uh, the Biot-Savart law. Uh, so. And again, uh, this uh, looks awfully similar to what we did in, ele in uh, electrostatics. So if you have an observation point here, and you ask yourself, how much field does this current alone produce? You could say, OK, Biot-Savart says that it will be uh, I dl cross r minus r prime, which is this vector here divided by 4 pi, etc., etc., r minus r prime cubed. So it will be given by uh, a cross product. So if you do this cross product uh, between the current and this vector, that will give you something that points in this direction. And there will be always a symmetrically placed current, because I have an infinite uh, distribution somewhere here, for which the r minus r prime is like this. And now that will be uh, sort of a, a challenge, but the current flows outwards. The uh, vector of the distance goes this way. And therefore, that magnetic field will be pointing this way. You add those two up, and you see that the magnetic field in total points in the x direction. And if you repeat it on the downside, you will see that it points in the minus x direction. So I find the first way a bit more intuitive. The second way will twist a little bit your uh, arms, but uh, you can find exactly the same answer. So now that I have this function f of z, I know where the magnetic field lines are. I can choose the Amperian path accordingly. So I apply the Ampere law like this. So this is, uh, again, that's my x-axis, the z-axis. This is where the current flows in the y direction. Uh, the magnetic flux lines are like this. So I will choose the following path. Uh, let me use another color. 
something like this. So one, two, three, four. So that is my, my path. I had previously said that the path should follow the magnetic flux lines. But it's also OK here to have sections like 2, 3, 1, 4 that are perpendicular to those lines. Why? Because those in the left hand side will give me 0 h dot dl along this path. dl is like this. The magnetic field is in this direction. So when your dl is perpendicular to the magnetic field, h dot dl is 0. And therefore, those paths, uh, so segments 2, 3, and 1, 4 will just give me 0 contributions to my field. So let's see what we get anyway. So this h dot dl can be expressed as integral from 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5 of h dot dl. And uh, I have already the expression for uh, h dot dl that I have assumed. So from 1 to 2, and let me also call this uh, width w. From 1 to 2, I'm integrating, as you see, along the x-axis from some x1 to x1 plus w. And I have a magnetic field that is f of z x hat x hat dx. So you see that one will give me f of z times w. It's an easy integration, as it always has to be. Uh, and uh, by the way, this is uh, z, and this is minus z, the coordinates of the upper segment and the lower segment. I have placed those two horizontal segments symmetrically with respect to the uh, plane. <coughs> then I have uh, the segment 2 to 3. Uh, you see that uh, this can be either uh, ab above uh, the plane or below the plane. So it can be either f of z or minus f of absolute value of z. But in any case, it points in the x direction. So either plus or minus, it points in the x direction. Whereas my path points in the z direction. So I don't even care what is uh, the magnetic field in these points, because I have this dot product, x dot z, which is 0. So you see that this will give me no contributions. This is reminiscent of what happens when you calculate electrostatic potential, if you remember, where we had these paths for the electrostatic potential that were uh, going either, either along the field lines or perpendicular to the field lines. And perpendicular to the field lines, you don't care what is the field because e dot dl is 0. So here, h dot dl is 0 uh, at 2 to 3. So let me go uh, here at the top of the board uh, to do the uh, 3 to 4. So 3 to 4, I go from uh, x1 plus w now to x1. I am below the plane, so therefore my um, function is minus x of f of z. So I have considered z to be positive in here. Uh, that's why I get the coordinate of this segment to be minus z. It is negative. Uh, z here I consider to be positive. And uh, that will be integrated from x dx. 
Uh, many times people are making the mistake to say, if I'm going to the negative x direction, I should put a dl minus x dx. That's wrong, because dx is an algebraic quantity. So the sign of dx will already be accounted for from the integration. You see this integral goes from a high uh, lower bound to a lower lower bound, from x1 plus w to x1. So therefore, at the end, this integral will give me already minus w. Uh, and hence, I shouldn't be double accounting this by uh, setting this dl to minus x dl. dx is actually an algebraic quantity. So it can be positive or negative depending on which direction you are integrating. And finally, I have this uh, uh, last segment from 4 to 1, where again, the integral is uh, includes a dot product between uh, x uh, uh, hat and z hat, and therefore is also 0. So all in all, from the first integral, I have f of z times w. And from the second integral, I have minus f of z times, you see I have the integral from x1 plus w to x1. That gives me minus w. So both of them give me the same result at the end, and I have 2 times f of z times w. And again, for z greater than 0. So now the enclosed current on the uh, right hand side, how much is that? Any, any ideas? We have discussed quite a bit this notion of the surface current. So any ideas how much this is? We have a surface current density, js naught. We're integrating over with uh, w. So how much will that be? OK, so uh, let me remind you, if this was a volume density, if this was a volume density, you would have current J naught amps per meter squared through this cross section. Your total current would be J naught times H times W. OK, the area is H times W. Uh, volume current density, like the one that we had in the first example, is J0. So you have J0 times the area. Okay. Surface current means that you are going to the limit where this J0, this X, A, H, sorry, height goes to zero. So this goes to zero. J0 has to go to infinity for the current to remain um, finite. And this product is what we call surface current density. So you see that the current will be the surface current density times the width over which the current flows. So here we have a width w, and therefore the enclosed current is this. And finally, Ampere's law says that 2f of z times w will be js0 times w. Likely, the w's that was a dummy variable that I introduced for the purpose of applying Ampere's law, but it's not part of the geometry, cancels out. And uh, that tells me that f of z is actually not even a function of z. Not even a function of z. It is a constant. Uh, so overall, I go back to the original formula, my assumption for H. And I have that H will be this for positive Z and minus this for negative Z. So that is my answer to the problem. Okay. Notice the duality. With uh, this problem in electrostatics,
where I had the infinite charge plane with uh, a surface charge density rho s sub naught. And we had found back then, if this is uh, the z axis, the electric field lines always start from these positive charges. And the electric field is rho s by 2 epsilon naught for z greater than 0 and minus rho s by 2 epsilon naught in the z direction for z less than 0. So you see the electric field lines are open. They start from positive charges and they just go to infinity, whereas the magnetic flux lines are flowing along the uh, axis and they are closed. It's a de degenerate case of closed field lines in the sense they are closing at infinity. So practically, as we said uh, last week, if you have a finite uh, plane like this and the current flows outwards, just like the planes that we have in uh, printed circuit boards, Uh, the magnetic flux lines would actually be something like this. So it would be axial away from the edges, but then they would actually tend to close outside the board. So if you had a, sort of a printed circuit board, a plane that carries a current uh, over a finite width instead of an infinite width, then the field lines would be similar to the ones that we calculated away from the edges. And then close to the edges, you would see this uh, fringing uh, with the field lines turning around so that they can close upon themselves outside the, uh, the current carrying plane. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the total picture with finiteness taken into account. All right, um, any questions? Questions? So we talked about volume uh, current distributions, surface current distributions. Uh, I'd like to uh, go now to uh, line currents. And uh, and uh, such line currents is uh, the ones that we will see in the following examples, probably I will have to extend though to cover those in the next lecture, uh, are the, on the top, the solenoid, very similar to the one that we saw in the demonstration uh, last week. Uh, so you have uh, basically a wire that uh, has been uh, wound around a core, a cylinder, and uh, that is being used to implement uh, inductors, for example. It's part of uh, electric machines, uh, charging systems, so there are many uh, such applications. A, a solenoid with uh, biomedical applications is the one that you encounter in MRI. So in MRI machines, uh, we have a, a large solenoid uh, that uh, is supposed to produce a uniform magnetic field. And it is uh, in there in the chamber where uh, you slide the patient uh, to uh, take the image. Uh, and uh, what you see here is uh, a simulation uh, that I took from uh, Comsol, uh, the um, software vendor. I think uh, there is a console license also available in the engineering labs. And uh, what you see here is an MRI coil around the human head. So the simulator uh, has calculated the magnetic flux density in the coil, uh, uh, introducing a phantom head in the simulator. So you see the uh, position of the, of the head. And um, the main design goal in such coils 
is to produce as much uniform magnetic field as possible inside the chamber. <coughs> so it is important for the clarity of the image, the quality of the image, that the magnetic field be as uniform as possible inside the cage. So this is a subject of uh, optimization the, of uh, those coils that is being pursued with simulators like this. So here what you see is magnetic flux density. In fact, it uh, says it right here in units of Tesla. And you see that in the place where you are supposed to uh, have the person who is taking the uh, head MRI, the magnetic field density is indeed uh, very uniform. So this is uh, one application of such coils. Uh, there is another one that um, really comes uh, to mind that uh, is called transcranial magnetic uh, stimulation. You may have uh, heard of deep brain stimulation, neuromodulation, uh, many times that is done with electrodes. Uh, so you just uh, put electrodes on the head and those are introducing currents and uh, those currents are supposed to stimulate uh, certain nerves. It's being used uh, for treatment of various uh, neurological uh, conditions. Uh, an alternative way to do this stimulation is through an electromagnetic coil. And in here, what we have is really, again, solenoids. And those solenoids are producing a magnetic field. Uh, many times, what you see right there, uh, so this is an applicator that uh, is available in the hospital. Many times, this is implemented as a helmet. So we just wear the helmet and you have the coil uh, right uh, embedded in the helmet. And uh, the purpose of this is to introduce a magnetic field. And why is that? So that is important and useful in, in two ways. First of all, you have seen in electrostatics that electric fields interact with natural media very strongly how through those uh, dipole moments that are being introduced. You remember when you slide the dielectric inside a capacitor, the electric field polarizes the medium, the medium responds. As a result, we have a reduction of the overall electric field through a dielectric permittivity. We model this effect with epsilon r. That's what epsilon r does. When we say that free space has epsilon equal to epsilon naught, but uh, plaster board has five times epsilon naught. We mean really that if I apply an electric field here, I will have 10 volts per meter. If I go and apply it in plaster board, that will be 10 divided by epsilon r volts per meter. So the plaster board will polarize itself and will react to that external electric field. Okay. Uh, similar things happen in magnetism as we saw uh, in the previous lecture and we will uh, review more systematically next week however the thing is that our tissues don't have magnetic properties so all these things with the magnetic dipoles that turn around and so on these are features that you encounter in magnetic media we don't attract pieces of iron we don't have magnetic properties so therefore the human body is relatively insensitive to the magnetic field interacts much less with the magnetic field than with the electric field. That's why you have imaging modalities that are based on the magnetic field that are highly successful, like MRI. Whereas the electric field, let's say we have antennas for communications, but if I use microwaves to image the human body, they don't penetrate well into the body. The body reacts uh, very strongly to the electric field. And we have also absorption. Uh, we have uh, heating of, as you know, from the microwave oven. An electric field interacts strongly with uh, your food and then warms it up. Well, if that happens in the human body, it is actually a dangerous effect uh, because it uh, produces uh, reactions that you don't want to have. This kind of thing we don't have in the magnetic field. And that makes it a very uh, useful um, field for such modalities. That's the one thing. The second thing that is done here is what we will see in three weeks, Faraday's law. Time varying magnetic field introduces currents in the tissues. So you don't need electrodes to stick on the, on, on the patient's skin. You can do it wirelessly with this applicator. The applicator will introduce the magnetic field. The magnetic field penetrates and then introduces the currents that the doctor needs in order to 
apply their uh, uh, therapeutic uh, procedure. So I will stop here uh, and uh, we'll do the examples that I have with solenoids and the toroid. The toroid is the second uh, structure that I will uh, solve uh, next time. So thanks for your attention. See you uh, on Monday.